My last video suggested that all those without access to the means of production should stop targeting one another and start punching upwards together. Continuing with the theme of Black Lives Matter, this video focuses on the center and its rhetorical concealment of the material realities of its capitalist system. The center presents its particular mode of governance as being benign, democratic and compassionate. It leads us to believe that it operates a capitalist economy because, as the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. In other words, capitalism is portrayed in the hands of centrist governments as a tool for the effective generation of wealth. They argue that if we allow capitalists greater scope to manage this social good, that wealth will eventually trickle down to its actual producers, the wage labourers. Of course, while there exists empirical instances of capitalism lifting people out of poverty, ultimately it will always undermine this process, as while in a total sense, many people are offered an income for producing the wealth, in a relative sense, the owners of the means of production will always earn exponentially more than this, allowing them to accumulate power and lobby to dismantle any barriers to the reproduction and expansion of their capital, including regulations determined by governments relating to both wealth distribution and the capacity of companies to continuously source cheaper forms of production. The centre leads us to believe it employs capitalism for the greater good of society, but the fact of the matter is, capitalism employs the centre to ensure its own reproduction constantly lobbying it for less and less binding regulations. The centre claims to be democratic, but its arrival in mainstream politics followed a conference featuring a white paper by Sam Huntington outlining the detrimental effects democracy was having on society. The centre has since done its best to undermine our collective capacity to politically determine the nature and conditions of our society. Measures include dismantling the system of collective bargaining for workers and generating a post-political narrative that downplays our already meagre political democracy, suggesting in its place technocratic solutions while declaring the end of history and framing the answers to our era's big questions as requiring expertise to the exclusion of public opinion. The centre leads us to believe it is benign, except in kowtowing to the mandate capitalism sets it, and in dismantling democracy as a barrier to that mandate, it lies to us, claiming to be on our side, claiming to be in control, with our best interests at heart, claiming to be rational and reasoned, helping identify for us the extremists infiltrating our borders, taking care of them for us, so we needn't worry. The centre does all this while concealing the fact that its dogmatic support for capitalism is killing us and destroying our planet, that it is on the side of capital, not ours, that it is not in control but capital is, that it promotes capital's interests, not ours, and that it is highly irrational and fanatically ensures at all costs the hegemony of its actually extremist ideology. One method of ensuring the hegemony of the radical centrist project is to portray to its consumers areas of the world that struggle against capitalism and offer alternatives to neoliberalism as being unstable and authoritarian, contrasting this portrayal to the benign, democratic system of the centre that puts before all the sanctity of the individual. Earlier this year, centrist mass media reported heavy police repression by the Chinese Communist Party when democratic protests erupted in Hong Kong. The police violence in Hong Kong was portrayed as an illustration of China's disregard for the individual freedoms centrist governments claim to value so highly. And while centrist governments nominally value individual freedom, in real terms this rhetoric merely provides a logic buttressing neoliberal ideology and the truer sanctity of capital. Centrists argue that capitalism is the only system humans might possibly come up with, considering the cost of transition to the unknown, that places the individual so centrally within society. But does it actually do this, or does the logic of this rhetoric help legitimise capitalism, which in turn centralises capital in society, displacing the individual? It is true that centrist society fetishises the individual, manifesting in long-standing cults of personality, but when only a small section of centrist society is permitted to flourish as individuals, just as in China and elsewhere, can we really say this amounts to valuing individual freedom? The lack of depth of the value on the individual by centrists in power is cut in stark relief by the reaction of the neoliberal US federal state and centrist media to the Black Lives Matter uprising prompted by the recent killing of George Floyd. In an attempt to minimise the cause for outrage expressed by the uprising, the press brought Floyd's character into question. Some outlets reported that Floyd already exhibited serious underlying health issues. This, they claimed, placed in question the cause of death. Was it really a racist cop who murdered him, or did George Floyd die during police custody due to poor life decisions that compromised his resilience to such routine treatment? The framing of the event in this way is an attempt to appeal to the neoliberal common sense that pervades centrist society. If Floyd was of better character and made better life decisions, if he was more responsible for himself, the actions taken by the police would not have led to his death. 
All that this should really highlight, however, is the limits of neoliberal ideology in placing the individual at the centre of society. Centralising the individual would mean that a society would nurture the vulnerable so that they might flourish, not diminish their very chances of survival by excluding them from support for the very fact of being vulnerable. As an ideology, neoliberalism seeks to continuously burden the individual with the personal responsibility of conducting themselves in the expanding and increasingly financialized capitalist marketplace where they must compete for resources with corporations that generate more wealth than most countries. Under the logic of the centrality of the individual and within the capitalist context, the individual is placed under such enormous pressures that it is unable to function effectively at all without access to considerable material resources, the likes of which only a fraction of people have. The logic results in identifying the crushing limits of the individual in capitalism as a limit or failure of the individual itself. The use of this logic in this context misses completely the force of that context, of capitalism. It assumes that, being the best system to render the value of the individual in society, capitalism is a totally neutral phenomenon in the equation of the fate of any given individual. A system that authentically seeks to centralise the individual would recognise the limits of capitalism in rendering that value in society and arrest its influence immediately. If you want individuals to flourish, you release the crippling pressure just as you would lift your boot from a plant if you wished it to grow. If we want to more explicitly examine how a centrist society values the individual though, we only have to look at videos of how their own protesters are treated. One striking video emerged during the height of the Black Lives Matter protests of a 75 year old man being floored by a member of the police in Buffalo in the US. The police cracked his skull open off the path, leaving him with a permanent brain injury. If this video was captured in Hong Kong, it would have been framed as evidence of the status attributed to the individual by other systems. That it happened in the benign democratic US, the centrist media framed it in as minimal and specific a sense as possible and attempt to give the impression that police repression of political action there is clinical and infrequent and totally in line with the sanctity of the individual. But while this explicit visual evidence of the diminished respect for the individual under centrist regimes is plentiful and displays even more zeal than their Chinese counterparts, this is not the crucial mechanism the centre ultimately represses individuality with. For that, we must return to the logic of the individual in the context of capitalism. Significantly, the Black Lives Matter uprising brought to the attention of general US society the disparities in material wealth and disenfranchisement people under capitalism were experiencing. Many involved in the uprising were careful to attach to the actions the significance of the role capitalism has played and continues to play. First, in the colonial acquisition of African slaves that were brought to the Americas by European capitalists and then, despite the abolishment of slavery over 150 years ago and the prominence of the civil rights movement over 50 years ago, how the lives of individual black people seem somehow to still matter less. If capitalism had managed to extend liberalism during the course of the last century to all races and genders, then leaving aside the ability to flourish, why are these groups still struggling to feel safe? Centrists rhetorically champion the centrality of the individual. To ensure its centrality, they give actual centrality to capital, arguing that capitalism affords the individual its best chance to flourish. We must therefore and at all costs ensure capital reproduces itself. To do this, it must expand continuously. The eventual centrality of the prime value here is undermined by the presiding centrality of the thing given as its necessary condition. This is not necessarily problematic. We all follow this logic at times. It is essentially to put off enjoying something we value so that we may have it in an enhanced form sometime in the future. Like undertaking a rigorous exercise and diet regime to achieve a desired body shape, or a nation undergoing a year or two of austerity to build up the resilience in the foundation of its economy before it starts earning and spending again. But when instead of enjoying your new body eating and drinking among friends, you must maintain it by continuing the strict exercise and diet, or that austerity must continue indefinitely for various arising reasons, then the presiding centrality of the conditional act displaces the possibility of the centrality of our prime value. If capitalism is the condition underlying the possibility of that which we value the most, individualism, and it must be reproduced and expanded infinitely, then the centrality of the individual by means of this condition can never be realised. It cannot then be a capitalist society's prime value, despite being the very reason given for a capitalist society at all. In taking over a century to achieve the systemic regulation against overt racist discrimination in the US, black people were delivered to the possibility of gaining a material foothold in society just as capitalism was about to become deregulated, an act displacing that possibility further into the future. If, for the generation of labour that benefited materially from the post-war period of social democracy, 
access to that wealth was about to diminish over time. For those beginning at zero, the centrality of the individual under neoliberal ideology meant effectively nothing. What good was freedom from slavery and the civil rights protecting the quality of that freedom if it was to be increasingly undermined by the more subtle discrimination of a system that requires of the individual access to and a modicum of control over material wealth to leverage anything within it at all? At the advent of neoliberalism, the comfortable in the US were on the path to becoming poor. The poor in the US would soon be immiserated. Black people who, through no fault of their own, having struggled through a disgusting and overtly racist recent history at the hands of colonial capitalists, a process singling them out in such a particular and uniquely evil way in US society, would now have to struggle against another form of brutal discrimination. For the crime of starting with nothing, from the 80s on, they faced the tyranny of the market. The tyranny of the market manifests in a logic that is incapable of erecting a human-to-human -human interface. What this means is, if a country seeks debt forgiveness for the millions who are suffering under crippling poverty, the international system is bound to inaction, because offering unconditional aid undermines the system as a whole. This logic is presented as the reason for the failure to act. The logic permits us only to view the crisis under its principles of commerce and finance. The possibility to forgive the debt remains outside the realm of that logic, prohibiting us from undertaking the very human act of sending sufficient material resources to alleviate on a fundamental and sustainable level the human suffering the people of that country endure. The centrality of capital and the infinite displacement of the individual conditions our relations with one another so as to exclude the human response. The human-to-human -human interface is mediated by the logic of capital, a logic that cannot be undermined for, supposedly, the sanctity of the human individual. This incapacity to erect a human-to-human -human interface prohibits us from acting effectively when millions of desperate and outraged people demand action on climate change. Our institutions, the depositories of our collective sovereign power, respond not by swiftly enacting the clearly necessary regulations that will halt the impending event that will singularly bring a stop to the possibility of the centrality of the individual in a very totalizing sense. Instead, they withdraw for decades of negotiations in order to arrive eventually at a feeble plan to extend the market system and allow us to distribute the production of pollution across the planet. To do otherwise would mean undoing the continual expansion of the market into all aspects of our society. This is the very essence of the madness of capitalist dogma, to intensify exposure to the cause of the malady in addressing the symptom. Is this not an elegant definition of extremism? We witness this incapacity at the hands of market logic once more in our failure to erect a human-to-human -human interface with an individual who finds themselves out of work coming to the government to ask for help but are told by the government to first key their life story into a digital transcriber that must unfortunately be found elsewhere. When this person explains that neither do they have access to nor the education required to operate this machine, they are simply told to leave and find assistance elsewhere and to ensure they do so in a timely manner or else they'll be entitled to nothing. If we were to transcend this mediating barrier, the logic of the market, and erect and operate a human-to-human -human interface, we would surely act directly as a human on our recognition of the suffering of this other human. We would act on the feeling, the compulsion in the face of the evident misery to do all we can to alleviate their suffering. We would fill out the form for them, find a machine and teach them how to operate it so that they could independently fulfill this ridiculous and dehumanizing task. We would find and give as much money or food or other material resources to this human as we could manage. We would rip out the machine in rage and disgust at the total lack of humanity the market stands for and imposes on us. We would scream and cry and break down and draw others who feel this way and turn together to follow the logic to its root and on finding it, burn it to the ground. We wouldn't give a shit about the statues or the names of streets we passed along the way. Those things are just something the nervous centrist media would focus its reporting on to undermine the possibility of this movement's success. And speaking of statues, Karl Marx once outlined for us that in capitalism we substitute the material relations between things for social relations because we exchange things with money and money represents the value of social labour. In using money then, we swap out the social relations between people and replace them with material relations, as while money is a social system, it is represented by material objects. In placing value mediated by money as the social relation between material objects, we are condemned to recognise the value in other human beings in terms of that material object that acts as money, which represents that intrinsic value to us all, labour, without which we starve and die. Our relationship with other people under capitalism is constituted by seeing the value of others only in this mediating material object, 
This is the tyranny of the market, the limit of capitalism to realizing the centrality in our society of the individual. It robs us of the possibility to respond as humans to one another, a true condition for individuals to flourish. Humanity lies outside the logic of the market. We can only greet one another in social terms outside that logic, but the space for this is decreasing all the time, ever since the day John Locke had such a hard on after watching a peasant grow more food for his landlord than their neighbours, he had to go and write a book about it all, instigating liberal philosophy. And while the lives lost through wars and revolution conducted in the name of this philosophy amounts to roughly 100 million people, we continue counting its toll when we consider the full extent of this inhumane logic. With the displacement of the centrality of the individual in society and the presiding centrality of capital, we start to count the lives lost to austerity, thought to be responsible for not only the direct deaths of people dying of increasing poverty in modern developed countries, but also tens of thousands of suicides in the UK alone. That capital, not the individual, is our society's de facto prime value, it also informs the policies that currently compromise the health and safety of people during the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, already causing more tens of thousands of unnecessary deaths in the UK. This logic amounts to the same disregard for the human individual as any politically authoritarian state. It is the tyranny of the market, of capitalism. The same tyranny that, when the free market consolidated and retracted, forming inevitable monopoly powers, those powers turned to empire and colonialism to continue expanding capital, robbing countless human individuals of their homes, lives and society in trafficking them from the continent of Africa to the Americas to perform free, compelled labour. It is the same tyranny robbing generations of countless people descendant from those slaves of their lives as they would have been otherwise, continuing to rob them today as it fails to invent within its logic and ideology the necessary sense of justice to deal with this disgusting and shameful tragedy other than to let the winds of freedom blow those souls where they may, under the knee of white supremacy it seems.